I want to show you how one of the most powerful men of God in all the Bible lost control of his life for a season and how he got back in control. We're talking about Elijah and his battle with Jezebel. You know the story very well, but let me remind you of some of the circumstances. Remember, he calls, there's a famine in the land, and he calls all of the prophets of Baal. There are 450 prophets of Baal, and there are 400 prophets of, of the goddess Asherus. And this is 850 false prophets. And they build two altars there, one to Baal and Asherus, and one to the Heavenly Father. And of course, you know the story, Elijah waits for them uh, unsuccessfully to call fire down on their altar, their God doesn't answer. It deaf and dumb and, and uh, just a piece of uh, nonsense. And then he puts 12 barrels of water upon his altar after building a ditch around it, prays a simple prayer and a fire God comes down, not only licks the sacrifice in the altar, but licks up all the water. And the people fall on their face and say, God is God, he is God, Jehovah is God. The prophet Elijah picks up a sword and he tells every man to get his sword and they, they bind these prophets and take them down the mountain by the brook Kidron and, and slay every one of them, kill 850 false prophets. Uh, Ahab is watching all of this from his royal chariot at the bottom of the mountain and Suddenly, the prophet goes back up on the hill and he begins to pray. He said, uh, I see the cloud about the size of a man's hand. He outruns Ahab's chariot into the city of Jezreel. Remember, he outran it. This is some 18 miles. This old prophet outran the king's horses, which probably the best horses in all the land. Now, that's the Holy Ghost. I'm lucky if I can run three blocks at my age. I know he's older than I was, and he ran 18 miles out running. The Holy Ghost came on him. Hallelujah. Now he, he's sitting outside, evidently he's sitting somewhere in the city, and he's waiting. He's, he, he's wondering now, maybe this is the time. He's so excited. Uh, surely when Ahab rehearses this whole thing, how the fire came down, there's going to be a fear of God in her. And when she finds out 850 of her prophets that, that sat at her table that she financed, that, that, that uh, she paid for, and all of this false worship she's, she's introduced, introduced in Jerusalem and Judah, now she's going to tremble because there's going to be a riot in the city. I think he was waiting for a riot. I think he was waiting to see her grab her belongings, get on her royal chair, and skadoodle out of town. But that wouldn't happen. The Bible says that she sent a messenger. She sent a messenger. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. Here's a godly, holy, righteous man. This man is moving in the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. This man is under the direction of the Holy Spirit in everything he said and did. This man is without, he, he's not living in sin. He's righteous, godly, pious. He's in the will of God. He is single-handedly under the anointing of God, performed one of the greatest uh, workings of God's Spirit in the land and the history of Israel. And now he's full of faith. He's excited. God is about to send a great revival into the land. God is going to move in a mighty way. And folks, watch out after God blesses you. Watch out when you're walking a clean, pure, holy life and the hand of God is on you. And you think, man, it's clear sailing right through. From here on, everything is fine. No, 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 no. That's when the messenger of Satan is sent. That is when the devil sends a messenger. <clears throat> there are two battles in this story now. There are two battles. There's the battle uh, on the mount that was between the devil and God's corporate body on earth. You see, that battle up there was, was not uh, Elijah's battle. That was God's battle. It was between Jezebel who, who was the devil incarnate. The devil had incarnated her. And if Elijah's waiting for her to repent, he's got a long wait because, you see, the devil can't repent. The, de the devil is beyond repentance. He's so hard, there's no possibility of him repenting. There's no way she's going to repent. And th there's, there are two battles here. There's the battle on the mountain. That's the corporate battle of the body uh, or the church against the the spirit of wickedness of the age. 
You know, there is a battle in the land that we're all involved in, the church. We've got Christians that are demonstrating against abortion, which is wonderful. We've got Christians who are praying, uh, getting into politics and trying to change the government from the inside. That's commendable. Uh, see, these are corporate battles of the body of Jesus Christ against that sin out there, against the inroads of homosexuality. See, these, these are the great battles of the church, but they're really not our battles. It's God against the devil himself. But you see, it's one thing to be involved in a mountain like that in this great battle of the corporate body against sin and the devil. But it's another thing when it becomes a personal battle. When it's no longer fighting homosexuality out there, it's not uh, demonstrating or marching about uh, some political thing or abortion. But the devil says, hey, you've done enough damage to my kingdom. You're a praying man. You're a praying woman. You've got uh, a Holy Spirit about you and you've done damage to my kingdom. Now, I'm going to make this a battle between me and you, a personal battle now. It's a personal battle now. There these two battles, one of them is, is now fading out, and the devil's saying, all right, you have come against me, and he's speaking through Jezebel. Now, I'm going to get you. I'm coming after you. I'm not coming after the whole church. I'm going to mark you. I'm going to point you out of the whole crowd. There were 7,000 prophets who never bowed their knee to Baal. They didn't get a messenger. Elijah got the messenger. He got the messenger. Now, here's a man that's subject like passions, just as we are. He was just as normal as you and, and I am. He was a man who felt things. He was a man who grieved, a man who wept and laughed and cried. But you're going to see the story unfold here tonight. A man of great victories, effective against the power of hell, but then when the enemy comes at him, he loses control. Elijah's personal battle is right here at the gates of Jezreel now. Now, <clears throat> this, this man is wanting probably <clears throat> to uh, see a riot in the city. He wanted Jezebel. He was so, so anxious for God to cleanse the, the nation. He, he would pay any price, see anything happened to move her out of her position and, and clear this evil situation up. And I, I think there's something else God's dealing with. He's dealing with some pride in this man because later that pride came out on the mountain when he's alone with God. Remember, the, the, he, he, he said, I'm the only one left, God, in all the land. I'm the only one left. There was, there was a famous evangelist, television evangelist, who just before he fell, got on television, and I was appalled when I heard it. He, he said, this is the only ministry God's anointed to reach the world. And he had a vision of, of a hundred harvesters that were all his. They're all harvesting in the harvest field. These were all his harvesting machines. No, folks, that was the the pride, the Bible says, that goes before destruction. And perhaps there's some pride in this man. He's the only one left in the land. Ahab told Jezreel all that Elijah had done and about how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah. Elijah's sitting here waiting for uh, the, the revival to break out. He's waiting for Jezreel to be uh, either slain or removed. Instead, he gets a messenger from Satan, a messenger from the devil himself. And here's what he is, she said, so let the gods do to me and more also, if I make not your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow this time. In other words, you slew my prophets, I'm going to kill you. Sir, you've got 24 hours to live. You're a dead man this time tomorrow night. This man is not in any danger because remember the young prophet he anointed, Elisha, who followed him? Didn't Elisha see a mighty host? He saw uh, this on horses. He saw a host of God's army. So it's the same army that's surrounding Elijah. Elijah is not any danger. In the first place, he says, listen to what she says, so let the gods do to me. She's swearing by gods who have just failed. 
He's swearing by gods who, who couldn't answer. So what's he afraid of? He, he saw, he had, a, he had a demonstration right before his eyes. He's swearing by a God that he defeated. And he's in no danger whatsoever. Folks, I don't care how the devil lies. I don't care how he rails against you. You're in no danger. You are not in any danger. He cannot touch you outside of God's permission. There's no way. Elijah, you're a dead man. Beloved, God allowed this personal challenge for a reason. <clears throat> it's one thing to be able to stand against the sins of the whole world, but then when the devil comes against you personally, watch out. When the devil brings these accusations, how different when the devil focuses all of his attention on you. And you see, he brings fear through lies. He has to tell lies to produce this fear. Elijah panics. In just a few hours, he goes from this bold, holy boldness, assurance, and spiritual authority to a fearful, despairing, depressed, confused man who's on the run. And he arose and ran for his life. He ran for his life. Now, folks, the devil's not trying to kill him. The devil's not interested in killing you. He's not after your dying, he's after your living. He wants to control your life, not your death. As I said once before, I don't know if you remember me telling you, can you imagine the devil going to a Christian's funeral and he, he, he says, I caused an accident in the first place, he can't do that without God's permission, and, and I, I killed him. Well, he's not gonna rejoice in sending people to heaven. Oh, there goes another and I just sent him to heaven, oops. Wrong channel. No, he's not interested in sending this man to glory. He wants to torment. He wants to keep him alive and torment him. The devil's not interested in killing you. He's after you making, he doesn't want to kill you. He wants to make you miserable. He wants to make you miserable in unbelief and doubt and fear and guilt. Satan knows that worshiping saints who are in the Word and living by faith are in control. It's the Holy Ghost who's moving in them. Of course, I'm telling you the Holy Ghost is in control, but we are the instruments by which that control is brought forth. And so what is, what is he going to do? He's going to try to come in with lies and panic you to get you away from the things of God. And now you find this man sitting on a, under a juniper tree asking God to kill him. Now, that's something for a man to say, Lord, take my life when he's running to save his life. Doesn't make sense to me. He's running to save his life, and he's sitting there saying, Lord, kill me. I don't want to live anymore. Jeremiah had that same battle. You don't go there, but in, in Jeremiah, the 20th chapter, verses 14 to 18, he, he's saying the same thing. Lord, uh, you've deceived me. If you go to the 11th verse, just three verses before that, He's got this great testimony. He's saying, the Lord is with me as a mighty terrible one. For my persecutors shall stumble. And they shall not prevail. They shall be greatly ashamed for they shall not prosper. Their everlasting confusion shall never be forgotten. Sing to the Lord, praise ye the Lord. For he has delivered the soul of the poor from the hand of evildoers. You know, wonderful testimony. God's in control. God's going to deliver you. And suddenly here comes Pasher, a governor of the land, of the synagogue, and he throws him in jail and accuses him of being uh, a false prophet. And then you hear the prophet in jail, the prophet Jeremiah's in prison, and he's saying, God, you've deceived me. And if you, you read chapter 20, verse 14 to 18, it's a, a, a terrible complaint of the man of God. He said, Lord, you've deceived me. You have forsaken me. I want to die. What happened? Confusion falls on the prophet. Oh, Lord, thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. I was fooled. Thou art stronger than I am, and you've prevailed against me. I'm in derision every day. Everyone is mocking me. He's saying, Lord, you've not kept your word. You've not fulfilled your word. You've put me through too much. I feel like I've been deceived. 
And I want to talk to you about this. There are people that don't understand how God can allow the devil to come and attack them personally. That he, that, that this Christian who's living so clean and righteous before the Lord, who has nothing but a desire to please God, somebody who's been in the word of God, somebody who's been walking in the spirit, somebody has no other desire but to fulfill the will of God, have abandoned their own will, and suddenly they become the focus of hell. Suddenly the devil is coming at them, trying to bring panic, threatening them, sending messengers out of hell itself, saying, you are dead, I'm after you. He, he gives evidence on all sides that he's out to destroy you. And he wants to produce this fear. And, and often God in this time will allow a tremendous time of testing. He, he's, do, he's trying to do something in this prophet that hasn't been accomplished yet. In spite of all of his past victories, there's still something God is looking for in this man because he has agreed to work for him to do. And, and, and you can say, well, God has to be with me. He's blessed me so much in the past. But if, if God is going to use you in greater measure, if he's going to make you a greater testimony, or if he's going to open wider doors for you, even of his own blessings, he has to bring you to a testing place. It, it, for example, uh, those who milk snakes for medical purposes, they, they actually milk the snakes. I've seen this done down in Florida. And what they do, they put them right in a snake pit to teach them. Now, I don't want to be a medical uh, milker of snakes. But sometimes God will let you go into the snake pit to teach you how to milk out of it his blessings. We'll, we'll get into that as we go a little further. Jer Nehemiah said when the enemy and the messenger of the devil came to him, he's, and the devil said, you better run. And Nehemiah said, should such a man as I flee, I will not run. Now, now folks, many of us don't need a message on, please be steadfast, don't run. You don't need it because you already ran. You're already running. Too late. You're already running. That, but, but you see, this is what the message is about. For you that have been running, those who are in panic, those who are in depression, those who, who, who say, I really know in my heart I'm doing my best to serve God. Nobody in the world will tell me that I don't love my Jesus. I know he's delivered me from sin. I know my, if I know my heart at all, I don't want to go back to sin. But you still don't understand how, because of that desire, how the enemy can still come at you with temptation, trying to overwhelm you, trying to get you to run, to go back to some old sinful way. I'm speaking to the guys here and others all through the congregation here. That's what the devil does. He wants you to run. And some of you in your spirit, you're not out there yet, but in your spirit, you're already running. You take, you've already turned, there's a panic in you. There's a fright in you. You're scared. The devil's going to get me. You're, you're afraid that you're absolutely going to forsake God and lose it all. Now, let me tell you how you can take control back in your life. If the devil has already come and he succeeded in, in, in trying to, he succeeded in bringing depression and fear, guilt, condemnation upon you. And I know God put this in my heart today. God really laid this on my heart that there were going to be people in this meeting tonight who, if your life is not out of control, the depression in you is out of control. The fear in you is out of control. Here's a, 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 a letter I received today from a sister. They come home. They were away. They come home. And a bunch of teenagers had gotten into the house and literally turned the house upside down, destroyed almost everything in sight. 12, 13 year old daughter had a kidney transplant and the kidney failed. The transplant failed. Same day a letter comes, they're gonna lose the house from back taxes. The mortgage company's pressing in. I think they have another four or five days loss of house, a child in despair, a uh, house ruined. And at the end of the letter, 
the dear sister said, Pastor, I'm going to trust God through it all. I'm going to trust God through it all. But you see, the, the amazing thing about that, this sister just a few weeks ago was backstage weeping and saying, Brother Dave, God, Pastor, God is really dealing with me. I love him like I've never loved him before. I heard a testimony. I'm going to give him everything. I may have failed him in the past, but my heart is determined to seek him with all everything in me. And I thought, well, now she's, that thing's going to change. She's, man, she's had so many problems in her home, husband and family, so many problems. Now maybe this is going to be the answer. And I felt real good. Then I got this letter today describing what's happened since that testimony of righteousness and a heart set for God. And now the messenger Satan is coming. Now he's trying to get her to run back to her old life of fear, doubting God, questioning God, saying, where are you? I, I'm trying to do the best I can. I love you. I'm praying. I'm reading my Bible. I'm seeking your face. Why, 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 why now? And there's, there, there, there's the prophet Elijah sitting on a juniper tree and says, oh, my Lord, my God. I have laid my life down for you. I've been jealous for your holiness. And now, look what you've done. You've allowed this woman to take control again. And this man is sitting out in the desert absolutely out of control. He's running. He's lost his, his perception. He's lost his Discernment, he's full of fear. He's depressed. He's down. God, you've forsaken me. God, you let me down. All right, how, how is this man going to get back in control? And how do you get back in control once this happens? First of all, you have to keep in mind that God is with you even in your running. Did you hear me? God is with you even in your running. In Elijah's despair and in his total confusion, he's fearful, he's wanting to give up. So God, what does God do? Does God chastise him? Does God reprimand him? Does God whip him? Saying, where's your power? Where's your strength? Why are you running? No, 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 no. He sends him a private butler and chef, an angel, to cook him a meal that's going to last him 40 days and 40 nights. Now that's some meal. That was a supernatural meal. And you know... When God sent this angel to the prophet Elijah under the juniper tree, I think I know what God told him to do. I think he, he said to the angel, he said, now, Elijah is my servant. I've sent him on a mission. He thinks he's failed. He's hurting. Be kind and patient with him. Speak softly to him. I still love him. He thinks I've given up on him. He thinks, he's, he thinks it's all over, but it's just beginning. I'm doing a work in him, and he doesn't know it. He doesn't understand it. I want you to cook him a good meal. I want you to make him feel comfortable, speak encouragement to his heart, and let him know that he's got to go on the strength of this meal, that he can't do it in his own strength. And that's when God comes to it, it's what he's trying to get you to the end of your strength. He told Elijah, the angel told Elijah, you can't do this in your own strength. You're going to have to go on the strength of this meal, this supernatural meal. Folks, that's the word of God. Hallelujah. He sent his word to us to bring healing. He sent the angel. Oh, glory be to God. What a, I, I don't know what was in that food. The journey's too great for him. He can't make it without eating and drinking the food that I supply. That the application should be understood by all of us. Isn't that easy to understand? The word and the spirit, drinking the wine of the spirit and the word. Do you understand what the prophet's saying? The journey's too great for you? Now, what he's saying to you right now, what you're going through is too great for you? You can't bear it yourself? This journey's too great? That's the only thing I can tell this sister. She'll be here Sunday morning, she said, and, and uh, I don't think I, if I see her backstage, I'm going to tell her, hey, this, this is too much for you. You can't handle this. She knows that, but she's got to be reminded that, that she's just got to just right now crawl in the lap of Jesus and just rest. Lord, I'm going to ride out this storm, live or die. I am yours. I'm your servant. My part is to keep my eyes on you and just trust you. What else can you do? You can't fight your way out. Hallelujah. He said, 
tell my servant this is too much for him to bear, but I'm going to give him the strength. I'm going to feed him. I'm going to supply what's needed to see him through. Hallelujah. Whatever, wherever you're running, whatever it is, God is still with you in your running. He was still with him in his running, wasn't he? Isn't that wonderful? He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I don't care what you're going through. I don't care what the devil's telling you. He's telling you you're no good. You're worthless. You're helpless. God says, I'm still with you. The angel of the Lord encamps around about you. The angel of the Lord is with you. Secondly, taking back control requires dealing with the Lord's still small voice. And you know what he's going to say? What are you doing here in this condition? What are you doing? Hiding. What, what are you doing closing up inside and so focused on your problem? Come on now. Some of you have been so focused on your past hurts. You've been focused on somebody years ago wounded and hurt you, and you're living on that. You're, 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 you're hiding in this cave of mental depression and mental anxiety and all these fears and all these lies of hell still bombarding your mind. And you forget, he said, I will beat to you a wall of fire around about your brain and your head and your body. And a still small voice goes, say, what are you doing still sitting here in this situation? Why are you sitting here pouting? Hmm. What are you saying, Elijah? How long are you going to let the devil lie to you? How long does this go on? Folks, I'm going to ask, some of you have been in this bondage for months and years. When does it end? You're saying the cross has no victory. You're saying that... that all you can do is try to find a little bit of relief. Not deliverance, but a little relief. No, God's not interested in just giving you relief. He's giving you deliverance. He's saying, Elijah, when are you going to wake up and end this foolishness? This hiding? Now, some of you here, you've been hiding in your problem. You've been hiding in your despair. You've been wallowing in your guilt. And that's the question, how long will you let this go on? You don't need to run. There is nothing to fear. I'm not mad at you. I need you. Your work is not done. Just wake up now. And remember who I am and who you are in me. Now, God needed to get to the root and the cause. He's after something in Elijah. And you know what it is? He, God needed Elijah to get to the root of his spirit. And here it is. Now listen to me closely. Here, here's what Elijah's thinking is. God, you let the devil get to me. You've allowed the devil to harass me. You've allowed the devil to take away my rest. You've allowed the devil to put fear in me. And I didn't deserve such treatment. I was holy, I was obedient, doing everything you told me to do. You let Jezebel loose on me. All my praying, all my faith, all my preaching, all my obedience, all my devotion to you, God. And I end up in the biggest personal battle in all my life. God, it doesn't make sense. There's no, there, there's no sense to this because I don't deserve this kind of treatment from you. And that's what God that's the, that's the spirit God's after in us. When we're going through tremendous trials and you say, God, I don't deserve this. I may have deserved it back then when I failed you when I was living in sin, but I don't deserve it now. You allow the devil to tempt me. You allow the, the enemy to come against me. You allow problems in my life that overwhelm me. It's not fair. And that's the kind of thinking God is after that has to end once and for all? See, it doesn't matter all the great works you do up on, mountain, up on that mountain. You can see great signs and wonders and miracles, but you've got to come down personally to live by faith. It's one thing to have faith for the whole nation. It's another thing to have faith for your own spirit. And he didn't have faith for himself. No, no, he had faith for the whole nation. But he didn't have faith to get himself through a single battle when the enemy came against him. 
And some of you believe God for the healing of all your family. You believe God can send revival to the nation. You believe God can pull down the powers of darkness and principalities and powers of spiritual wickedness in high places. But then when you go through your own little battle, down you go. Hmm. You're not going to get out. You're not going to get back in control until you get honest with God. See, when you learn how to resist the devil, the Bible says he's going to flee from you. Now, that's Bible. He could have resisted Jezebel and she would have fled. But how can you learn how to resist until the Lord puts you in a battle where you need to resist? How do you know you have strength and faith against the roaring devil until the Lord lets the roaring devil look you in the face? You... You know, uh, if, if, if a trainer of a boxer, I've, I've used this illustration once before. If, if you're going to uh, be the trainer of a boxer, what do you do? You bring a, a cream puff into the, to the ring, somebody's going to go down with the first blow? No, 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 no. You get the best, what do you call them? Sparring partner, you get the best, strongest sparring partner that you can find. This trainer, if he really loves his, his, his boxer, he'll get the strongest one in there and he'll let him go in there and go at it. He'll let his man go down a few times to train him, to harden him against the attacks uh, of the, uh, the oppressor. And that's the only way they're trained. And the only way God can produce faith in us is allow us to be in conditions where it's needed, where it has to be exercised. How do you know you have faith? How can you call on faith? How can you exercise faith until you're in a situation where it's absolutely needed? It's a life and death situation. And God allows us to go in there to see. He tests us with that. That situation you're in right now is a test. I, I was preparing this. And I get, I get a telephone call. And uh, I, I, I'm not going to get personal about it, but all of a sudden, and another call, and suddenly I'm overwhelmed by uh, some problems with my children. The, the situation with their, their children, uh, one has ADD, the other has, uh, I don't know what the other thing is, dyslexia, discovered dyslexia and ADD, and uh, uh, over here, another child calls and some deep uh, physical problems and I'm, I'm preparing this message <laughs> and I'm I'm going to come here and tell you about how to behave and how to get control when the enemy comes against you and that God's going to put you in a situation where faith is needed and suddenly I'm in it and the Lord says what are you going to do you know what I told the Lord? I walked around, I was praying just about an hour before coming to church. And I said, Lord, I'm laying this all on you. There's nothing I can do. It's beyond my power. And I'm not going to sweat it. I'm not going to beg you. I'm walking in covenant with you. You're my covenant partner. I give, I name this child. I give this grandchild to you. I give this grandchild to you. I give this child to you. I give this child to you. Well, I give the church to you. I give everybody everything to you. I said, Lord, this is not my problem now. It's yours. It's your problem. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to believe you. Come what may, it's yours. It's yours. You're not going to go around and say, well, I don't deserve this, Lord. I've been in New York giving my life. I've been doing everything, walking in holiness and righteousness. Why are you allowing this? No, 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 no. Lord says, I'm testing your faith. Are you going to trust me now? You're not going to preach theory. You're going to live it. So I'm not telling you fellas something I haven't practiced. Learn myself. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Thirdly, in closing, you're, you, you get back control when you begin to acknowledge and understand why God allowed you to endure this personal battle. He was trying to make you devil proof.
Well, it doesn't mean he won't allow the devil to come again, but now you will be an authority. You will have your punching. And the Holy Ghost is going to get a hold of that arm, and you tell me if your army is going to be all powerful and the Holy Ghost thrust it at the enemy. Because you have been in training, you have learned to stand in the floods and everything come against you. You say, well, this, the devil, he tried that um, a year ago or a month ago, and the Lord brought me out. I trusted him. He brought me out. I'm going to trust him now. He's going to bring me out, and you will stand. <laughs> Secondly, he's been preparing you for greater expanded usefulness in his kingdom. Look what he says to Elijah. Go, Elijah, return. Anoint Haziel, anoint Jehu, anoint Elisha. Elijah was being prepared to be a chosen vessel for a special work. And those whom God chooses for special work, he takes them through special trials. Hallelujah. So he departed from there. He's now in control. He departed from that cave. And that's my closing word to you. It's time for you to depart out of that, that, that doldrums and depression. It's time to you get up and say, in Jesus' name, devil, you don't hold me down anymore. You do not lie to me anymore. I will not be held by this. Your whole freedom depends right now on a step of faith. You can get out of it tonight. You can get out of it in the next few moments by simply giving up Laying down all of your despair and your depression, say, Lord, I turn it over to you. I'm not going to fight this anymore. Glory be to God. No more striving in the flesh. You know what? One of the great victories that, that God has uh, brought me into I was down to Bible school this week and, and preached to them along this line. This, the importance of giving up on the flesh. You see... I got delivered totally free from my flesh when I didn't expect anything out of it. And when I was no longer surprised by how evil it is. I'm never surprised at my flesh anymore. I'm never surprised when the enemy comes into my flesh and tries to put some kind of an evil thought. I'm not surprised that I'm capable of losing my temper once in a while because flesh is always going to be... I'm not surprised by anything in my flesh anymore. And that's where you get the victory. You're not surprised because you're not walking in the flesh anymore. You're walking in the Spirit of God. And you turn to the flesh and say, flesh, you don't control me anymore. I'm going to walk in the Spirit. I'm going to walk in faith. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. It's only through the Spirit we crucify the lust and the deeds of the flesh, crucified only by faith in the finished work of Jesus. Glory be to God. You can be in control of your life through the power of the Holy Spirit. You can be in control right now if you will simply resist and renounce every lie of the devil tonight in this service. The devil trying to tell you you're going to lose it all? You say, no. Because my God says in his word that he's going to keep me from falling, present me faultless before the throne of glory. The devil comes in and, and, and says you're, you're, you're depressed and you'll always be depressed the rest of your life. Go get medication and live the rest of your life on medication. Now, folks, I'm not asking you to, to, to lay down your medication right now. Don't, don't do something that God doesn't tell you to do. And, and, and there are many people that have uh, uh, deficiencies in the, in, in the brain and so forth, and, and that's a whole nother world. But I'm telling you now, if the enemy has come into your spirit, trying to get you to hide in a cave, trying to keep you in guilt and fear and depression that you'll never amount to anything. No, God's tested you for a reason because he's going to bring you out. You're going to be stronger this time than you've ever been. This time, you'll be able to stand and not fall because he brought you through these hard places. And all you did was trust him. You went into his word and you got the faith to stand. And you said, Lord, I'm not going to doubt you. I'm not going to question you. I'm going to rest in your love. I, I read this today in, in, in a statement. Some man, a little, something, a little book that he written. 
about crawling into the lap of Jesus when you're in trouble. Just climb up into his lap. Let him put his arms around you and just stay there till the storm is over. Just stay there trusting him. Can you picture it? Crawl in his lap and stay in his arms. Get close to Jesus. Hug him and let him hug you. That's the safest place I know. In your spirit and in your heart, draw nigh to me and I'll draw nigh to you. Hallelujah. Will you stand, please? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I know you put this word in my heart. There are some here, Lord, who have allowed fear to go out of control, depression, guilt. My Lord and my God, come by your Holy Spirit tonight and deliver. Lord, you want your people to be joyful in you. You want your people to live in peace and rest in the Holy Ghost. You don't want us to live in turmoil. You want to bring a quiet, calm, and peace to our heart, a living faith. It says, come what may, live or die, I am the Lord's. And not worry, not fret, not try to figure things out. But just say, Lord, all I have to do is love you, serve you. You'll take care of my family. You'll take care of my problems. You'll give me the wisdom to know what to do. You'll guide my steps. You'll lead me. If you're here tonight and the message was for you, you have to acknowledge, first of all, if you're not right with God, I want you to come here and get right with God. If you've been running from God, I want you to come down here and end your running. Stop your running right now. If you're here tonight and there's been something out of control, the enemy come with fear, depression, whatever it may be that's out of control, I want you to come down here and say, God, I want this to end tonight. I want freedom. God's been speaking to you. The message for me, you say, come and let the Holy Spirit finish the work that he's begun by his word. Amen.